Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. In today's show, we're going to talk about ranks in the martial arts and their influences on the arts themselves. I'm very excited to discuss this topic with my friend Reg Sakamoto. Before we start, please consider supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Spirit Aikido online program, which currently has more than 160 videos. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. In today's episode, I'm welcoming back my friend Reg Sakamoto, and we're going to have a discussion today about rank in the martial arts. Uh, Not only Udansha ranking or advanced Don ranking, but also Q ranking. So these are important factors in the Japanese martial arts and a lot of uh, martial art organizations. So I think there's there's a lot for us to cover here. Uh, and it was kind of started out, uh, I saw Reg posted up some thoughts on advanced Don rankings just this last week. And I thought to have him on the show, have him expound on his thoughts. Uh, Cause you know, on, you post online and you're kind of limited in, in conveying all of your thoughts. So let's get into it. So welcome again, back to the show. Thanks Tristan. Good to see you again, my friend. Yeah, you too. All right, so let's talk about uh, maybe start with the Udansha thing, since that's kind of how you led things off with your post. Okay, um, I'll, I'll use I'll use like for example one art as my like example. So I think in that post I was talking about kendo, since mm-hmm. I also as well as doing aikido practice kendo. So currently I hold the rank of second don in in kendo. And the dojo has been after me. Well, I've been a member of that dojo for 10 years. And they've been after me to like test, test, test. And I'm like, no, nah, it's, it's okay. It's not important. I don't need to test, test. I'm like, I'm never going to teach Kendo. So it's not important that I test, test. And I'm like, wow, sensei, I'm not, am I going to have more difficult opponents to fight if I test? Like, so then it became, I got a speech that if I don't test, it means I'm not willing to listen to their instruction. So therefore, if I, you know, they tell me to test and I refuse to test, then it shows them that I'm not willing to listen to their instruction. So I was basically like an insult. Yeah. So I was okay. Fair enough. So then I tested. So then I did my EQ and then tested again and did my shoulder. And then I was like, okay, that's fine. That's it. And then they're after me again, test, test, test. And I'm like, no, it's like, I fight in the dojo, I fight eighth dons and seventh dons and sixth dons. Like, am I going to have more difficult opponents now because I've like tested? Like, it's still the same opponents. So, and I'm not going to run a dojo. I'm not going to teach kendo. This is for my own. I, I do kendo for my, my own study, like my own research. It's not something I'll intend to teach. And they're like, well, test. And so, oh, okay. So I tested again, you know, got my meat on and then after me again test test and i'm like and say i'm i'm going back to canada you know so it's not really necessary and so they finally accepted that so now they're currently leaving me alone but (laughs) (laughs) but i feel i mean if i test is that the only benefit i found so for example currently in yoshinkan aikido i hold the rank of sixth down when I did my fourth Don test in Canada with my teacher, Kimeda Sensei, I prepared a year and a half for that test. Uh, I had my partners who I knew were going for the same test. So we would practice half an hour before every class and for an hour after every class. So the focus for the test was good. I mean, really like focusing on technique and then I was doing this, uh, I had a personal trainer that got me doing this barbell continuous workout. It's like eight different exercises with just an Olympic bar, no weights on it, you know, doing 20 repetitions of these eight exercises and you do like five sets and there's no rest period in between. Your rest period is like going to a bench and doing tricep dips on a bench. And it was great. It was fantastic. The first couple of weeks I did it a couple of times actually threw up after because it was like really taxing. And but I did that, you know, that and then like running and everything else I did for a year and a half to prepare for my test. And that test was probably one of the best tests that I've done. It was 
not a well done test. So I get the point of having a test to push yourself and to focus yourself. But I don't really know. I've been doing martial arts now. I'm 51. So 45 years. I still don't know what the numbers mean. I, I really don't know what it means. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know? and you bring up a good, and I think there's a distinction between the purpose of, of an actual test, like a, a performance evaluation, if you will, versus the actual rank that goes with it. Back when I was competing, you know, that performance evaluation would be a tournament or would be a competition. It would be, that's where you go to figure out what are the deficiencies in your training. You know, you, you work up, you have a focal point, and I totally agree with you. I think training without a focal point can be, can open the door for lazy training or, or the thinking of, well, I have plenty of time to go and improve myself here or there, or, you know, you go through your list of all the things you're working on. But when you have that focal point, it kind of lights a fire under your butt. It, it, it really, and, and that's a good thing to have. It, it puts a sense of urgency in a, in a deadline to your, to your work. Um, but I, like you, I, I've wondered about what is the exact purpose of these ranks? Because you can have testing without the rank. You can go through and have performance evaluations at given intervals or you know, set times or surprise or whatever. But I don't see that that really has any necessarily correlation with a, a given advanced rank. And when I kind of when I spent some time digging into this, I was like, well, you know, what purpose does these advanced ranks really serve? And I, and I found a few interesting things in that they came about when organ, martial art organizations started to get large and they needed to differentiate and stratify the students, the older more, much more experienced students, the intermediate experienced students and the younger students, um, even among the ones who've been studying for many years and, and Don ranking was a way to kind of get that stratification. And at least that's what I read. Um, and it seems to me like it was one of those things that specifically stu uh, suited to large organizations to kind of just bring a hierarchy to it because we humans seem to like order. We like knowing who's above us in the pecking order and who's below us. We always seem to seek those things out. And maybe it's to suit that. Um, you know, I, I think from what I understand of the Japanese culture, they are very minded for, for having that hierarchy. Where, where in the hierarchy do you fit? Um, and, and, and it brings a sort of order to who, who should you listen to, who's above you, and then who's beneath you, who do you, who has to, uh, follow your uh, guidance or orders or whatnot. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the purpose? Oh, you're muted. There you go. Am I okay now? Yep, there we are. Okay. Um, yeah, I... Uh, yeah, kind of there was a little bit of a bad connection so i yeah we're having bit some when you were talking issues on both sides i think yeah when you were i think weather is definitely plays a factor you said snowing there and here it's overcast because it's going to rain later here, ah, so, okay uh, yeah i think it plays a bit but uh when i caught the tail end of what you said so about knowing where you sit in the order in the dojo or knowing like who you need to listen to or who you don't need to listen to I used to train in, in Toronto when I trained with my, in my Aikido Dojo there, there was a guy named Ozzy. And Ozzy was a member of the Toronto ETF, which is the Emergency Task Force, it was a SWAT. Mm -hmm. So a really, really, really switched on individual. I mean, this guy was so fit, it was ridiculous. Sometimes after class, because he also did BJJ and I used to do judo. So we would do some ground grappling after class just to play around, just, just for fun. And, you know, you put a hand on his leg to pass his guard and you could not only feel the muscle heads, but you could feel every striation of the muscle, like through his gi pants. Mm. I mean, these, these guys get paid to work out three hours of every shift that they work. Like, right. so they're just really extra tough guys, right? You know, like really switched on guys. Mm -hmm. No one needed, he, he, obviously he was a black belt, but well, obviously he was a black belt, but 
no one, he didn't need a belt and he didn't need like to know where he sat in his presence alone. And mm -hmm. if you watched him train with anybody or I remember blocking one of his like Shomenuchi strikes and it actually busted two, two bones in my hand. Bad strike, bad block on my part for sure. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, I'm not exactly a, a delicate individual mm -hmm. and uh, didn't need didn't need the belt and didn't need any number before the belt to know that you should listen to him or to know right. that yeah it has a good way of uh, I don't know, natural hierarchy creates itself mm -hmm. because I've had also a number of guys that I've been in dojo that outranked me and I would listen to them because that's what the etiquette of martial arts states but uh, some of them like I would look at and they're guys who would throw you under the bus in a second you know what I mean mm -hmm. like they they, they character wise their technique remember the technique was okay mm -hmm. but if it was like down to like you could have got my back if we were in like a, a bad neighborhood you'd know that no not only would they not because it's not in their character but they could not because they absolutely training and actually using it is not they don't equate well, and those are the, the two common approaches or the justifications, uh, or rather, I should say the explanations of what the rank represents. Either it represents a set, a set level of skill, uh, you know, in, in the case of black belt ranks, you would assume that there'd be a pretty high level of skill and it would get higher for each rank, or that it represents uh, a certain amount of character that's, that's proven, that's shown. Um, and it really doesn't accurately reflect either one. It can, but it, it's not consistent. No. And it's, it's hard enough to have consistency across the arts, but no. it doesn't even have consistency within the art or even within an organization. And uh, to point this out, one of the things that, uh, oops, we're having another connection issue. Um, sorry, just in case that, that hiccuped. Uh, another thing is the idea of honorary ranking or ranking for reasons other than skill or for other than contributions uh, in terms of teaching classes or what have you. Oh, are we having another issue? Okay. Uh, one of the examples no, that I could remember, okay, I think we're maybe having another issue. One of the examples I can remember about uh, hearing of the traditional Japanese ranking system is that, like, let's say you have a, uh, a, an assistant at the dojo. And one of his duties is to make sure that students pay their tuitions. And so if a student doesn't pay a tuition, this, this student would go and remind them, you know, that you need to pay. Well, if somebody's like a third Don and this administrator is a lowly Q rank or something, they'll say, why do I need to, you know, I'm not going to listen to you when you tell me to pay my tuition. So the idea is that this administrator needs a, a sufficient rank that they can go remind people to pay their tuition and have the rank to have them listen to. So they'll make them a third or fourth done primarily just for this administrative duty or, or, you know, other things like that. There's a lot of ways to contribute to a dojo yeah. other than being a skilled martial artist. And, and that can really blur, yeah, of course. Yeah. blur the lines of, well, you know, what does this rank mean? And, um, and like you, I've run across, you know, high, high level black belt martial artists that don't have, really a martial bone in their body, um, you know, and not to say that rank necessarily is, is a reflection of hard skills. I learned that one very <laughs> through a number of firsthand lessons that it's not. Um, but what is it? And the conclusion that I came to is that it's almost entirely political. There's there. And that just means that there, it really doesn't have anything to do with hard skills. It doesn't really have anything to do with contributions to the dojo or to the organization. It doesn't have to do with character. It's some kind of amorphous kind of compilation of all three of them. And, uh -huh. and to try to pin it down, it's, it's kind of like trying to nail jello to the wall. You just can't, you can't really do it. Um, and then we add in the, and this is not unique to Aikido or I think any, even Japanese organization, I've seen this in, in other martial arts that have nothing to do with Japan, where they do have downward pressure from the top to rank instructors, to get in uh, high-level practitioners into being instructors 
because they can charge X amount for the test and X amount for the rank. And then, you know, but they'll, they'll tell like the, the, the chief instructor of a group, it's like this next six months, you better get 10 people lined up for that instructor rating. And they'll put pressure on them to, to, to have that so that their instructor can travel in, spend, you know, a week or whatever it is going through all the, all of these 10 and collect the money from them and then off they go. So it's, very much a business decision more than it is a how are we building a quality quality martial artists uh, mm -hmm. experience um, mm -hmm. and and with what these tests often charge you know uh, for what I what I remember from Shodan you know and I was in an organization that was actually pretty cheap basically it was I wasn't paying $500 or anything for a showdown test. It was basically the cost of my certificate and a, an embroidered belt. But there are places I've heard of seven, eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars for a showdown test, you know, on wow. up. Uh, and they get more costly as the each rank goes up. Not that the certificates yeah. get more expensive and you don't get another belt, you know, or maybe you get another belt, but generally not. Um, you know, it, it seems to be much more of a money thing or a politic thing than it is anything really related to, to actual skill. But to the student, it certainly is like it's I want the next merit badge or I want the next, you know, the next cookie or what have you. What, what was Napoleon's quote? It's uh, amazing what a man will do for a little piece of, of colored ribbon. Uh, right. And right. so I, I think that that's a factor, you know, it, in keeping people motivated uh, uh, to keep going up the ladder. And if there's a ladder there, like here, here look at the ladder, you know, here's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, stay on the ladder. Uh, it's easy, easy uh, to get, use that as a motivational tool, but I, I'm disappointed by the politics side and it's led to some kind of na nasty things. It gets almost cult-like with what people are expected to do uh, in order to get those ranks. Yeah, I'm pretty lucky. I mean, uh, in Yoshinkan, I exist. I mean, I don't know the whole Yoshinkan world. I mean, maybe other places are different. I don't know. But dojos that I've interacted with, trained in and interacted with, luckily that, I mean, the Don still exists, the Dani, you know. Um, I've never found like, like, well, one, it was never like overly expensive. Two, it was... I didn't get like, you know, you listen to me because I am, you know, like this. I never got any of that. I'm sure it absolutely exists. I'm just saying I've never experienced one of the the best. I mean, I never have an answer to how to, we can ever like fix this. I don't think it ever, something that ever really can be fixed, to be quite honest. I think people uh, love to hate it. I'm not sure. Yeah. But for example, I think I told you before, I I teach like, um, a very old Japanese sword system called Hyoho ni Tenichiryu. Mm -hmm. And my teacher was the, the well, he's retired now, but he was the soke, mm -hmm. like the headmaster of the, of the school passed down from Miyamoto Masashi straight through to him. Mm -hmm. There's no rank, like zero, nothing. There's no dan, there's no scrolls, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So I remember when he first told me to start teaching it when I was in, still in Canada, and I know how, well, I, I, at that time, I would say, I know how Canadians are and they like rank. Well, living in Japan now for the past 10 years, well, the Canadians are alone on that because I know that Japanese also like rank. Oh, sure. So I asked him, sensei, there's no rank. So what do I tell the students? You know, mm -hmm. and his, he just looks at me and he goes, you train or you don't train. <laughs> that was it. That's simple you know, clarity with that. That's for sure. Absolutely. 100%. You train or you don't train. That's, that's, that's it. Right. And that's how I've looked at. Yeah. Okay. So I think when, even when that post I talked about, because I was watching this phenomenon in this Kendo dojo and comparing it with Aikido, for example, um, this guy in my dojo just got his seventh time which I don't know if anybody maybe not familiar with, but in Kendo, like even when you go for an eighth on, you test for it. Mm -hmm. And the pass rate in Japan is like 1%. Yeah, Only 1% of the people 
going for eighth degree black belt actually pass. Not sure what the percentage rate is for seventh on. I don't think it's as low as 1%, but it's also not very high. Right. So, you know, the, That's a big the deal. gentleman, it's a, it's a big deal. And I often think it wouldn't be such a bad idea if Aikido continued testing all the way through. But anyway, that's mm-hmm. another, that's another, <laughs> that's, that's something else on its own. But uh, so I watched this new guy get his seventh done. And then, you know, he was given a certificate in front of the class and everybody claps, you know, congratulations. And then he like bows to everybody and then he puts his certificate back and then gears up, right? And all the eight, I, I have a pretty unique kendo dojo here in the sense that I have eight eighth dons in my dojo, which is like com- almost completely unheard of in Japan outside of like the police dojos because mm-hmm. the police is like really strong in kendo. They, the other like seventh dons and the eighth dons, they just pasted this guy. Mm. Like for the whole class, they just smashed him all over the dojo. He just got a seventh down. They're just just laying a beating on him. Not, not like hazing and like, right. you know, kicking him. And not, not, not like that. Nothing out of the ordinary of like vigorous Kendall, you know. Not but, outside the rules. No, not outside the rules and nothing like you'd look at and go, hey, you know, you want to like, you're going to kill this guy. But Buddy was gasping. and Getting lit up, huh? was, Oh, yeah. He was just getting like hammered all over the place. And then when he was done with all of them, other like fifth dons and sixth dons, they're running, you know, sensei, only guy show us, you know, off he goes. And so he, he was just nonstop for the whole class. And then I heard that this is going to go on for a while. Mm. from like one of my friends and so i'm like so what's what's that about and they're like well we we do it to remind you to like stay humble Mm -hmm. that you guys so it's a humbling process Mm. and i just sat there i smiled and i thought wow oh my goodness wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to have happen in the world of aikido (laughs) (laughs) well and maybe it's that that's the effort that you have to balance out with the prestige that is perceived that goes along with the higher Mm. rank if Mm. you think that it's a big Mm. prestigious thing then you know maybe as the reminder you need to get lit up in order to make sure you don't get a little big for your hakama so to speak yeah yeah you know i i myself is you know the if the if a rank doesn't really have a defined meeting or a standard or a um and i don't know how if you even could have a standard i mean how how would you take somebody yeah. who is say 60 years old and has been training like what their test would look like even if it's just a showdown i shouldn't say just a showdown because that that's a very important milestone in fact mm. i think it's probably one of the most valid ones in the martial arts mm. versus a 24 year old athlete what they're going to be expected to do to perform and show that they have they have earned a shodan rank or or Uh, or that level i i don't i don't think they should be the same you know but and therefore no i I think that there's there's room for obviously you know a, a martial artist personal growth but i do think there's a certain level of expectation of if you wear that black belt you should be able to stand proudly and represent your art and not be, you know, a laughing stock or have people wondering like, what, what on earth is this person doing? But, you know, you get somebody who's elderly, they have physical limitations, maybe they're handicapped or, or some other thing that shouldn't preclude them from being able to get, to improve themselves. And, you know, I think even having yeah. the expectation that rank is, is something that you have to be able to do i mean you don't want to have somebody say i'm not going to train martial arts because let's say i i am so physically incapable that that i will never be able to get to be a black belt so i'm not even going to bother training like that person should not be discouraged from from training and i that's where i think that the the rank model tends to be uh, a negative influence on martial arts and aside from the politics of the advanced ranks and all the other stuff that goes with it uh, the, you know, the shenanigans of charging money and, and that sort of deal, but just the expectation that, you know, everybody, I think everybody can gain a personal growth, a great deal of it from martial art training. And if they yeah. think, well, I'll never be a black belt either because I'm not talented enough or I'm not capable enough or I'm too old or whatever, that's kind of bad news to, uh, mm. it's a bad start. It's a no, that's a non-starter really. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always viewed personally my any of the ranks that I have. I've always viewed it as something very personal between me and my teacher. That's a so great they, way to put it. They felt that this is where I should be. That's been always my viewpoint on it. I don't, I don't have any issue. People do whatever they do. Mm-hmm. You know, people who get certificates and frame them and hang them up and this, that, that's cool. I, you know, like, but for me, it's always been such a personal thing that they're, they're over in a box. Mm-hmm. Not like crumpled up and like, I don't disrespect them. Like, but I just keep them over there as, because for me, it's so personal that what do I need to like display it for others? Because what it represents, the the frustrations, the yelling, the sometimes being reprimanded, sometimes being physical, you know, all, all of that to me, it like represents that relationship I have with my teacher. And it's something really, really, really special. And yeah, so I kind of, it's sometimes the only way I can kind of justify it to myself okay. to bother to even be a part of, to be a part of it. I don't mean to be a part of martial arts or to have the relationship with the teachers that I have, but to bother to even buy into like bother ranking up or grading up, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, it, it's almost like a catch 20. Mm-hmm. If I don't rank up, you know, I won't, I can't, rank my students up and I don't teach I don't teach anything as my job it's not my job um I I have I have a full-time gig and martial arts is just I teach on this side to be honest I would like to teach full-time only because I'm really selfish and just want to spend all of my time training that's it and it's not really about I have some gift to give the world because first of all, well, I don't really know anything. Second of all, I'm not very good. So I just want to train. That's all I want to do. And I'm just a Budo bum. Right. So Budo bum. I love that. That's why I want to teach. That's why I want to, that's why, that's why I want to teach full time. But in doing so, well, I know people are going to join that don't have the same mindset that I do. And that cookie, as you call it, or Mm -hmm. I like that, by the way, I'm going to steal that. That cookie is really important to them. Mm-hmm. And if I can keep them in the dojo and keep them training, and if that cookie is that important to them, okay, if you earn it, whatever that means, you know, then you can go for it. It's a catch 20 because I don't know how to like drop it and right. still, I don't know, be able to. I mean, I think somebody like yourself, and I, um, you know, I don't know if you know, like Aikido Sangenkai, so Mr. Christopher Lee, you know, Mm -hmm. he wrote a really fantastic article on there's something rank in the martial arts, and then saying how two or three, two or three times, I think, in that article, he stated that he tried leaving the, like, like dumping the system, Mm -hmm. but then unfortunately getting pulled back into it, you know, and mostly it sounds like mostly because of, students Mm. so i think there are people no i think i know there are people who don't care and would just train anyway Mm -hmm. you know um for example my teacher in canada kimeda sensei so if you're in aikido yoshinkan Mm -hmm. so he's ninth done but he's been doing he brought yoshinkan aikido to canada he is the father of yoshinkan in canada he brought it it didn't exist before him when until he brought it there he said when he he wasn't going to test, he got his, so he had his fifth on and he came to Canada. And then I don't know how long, like a sixth and then a seventh on for whatever reason, I don't know. But then he talked about they wanted to give him his eighth on and he didn't want it. And he kept refusing it. And then finally, Shioda Gozo Sensei himself called him on the phone and yelled at him and said, why are you refusing my rank? And so then he had no choice because Shota Sensei was angry at him that he had to take it. So, but he was never interested in it. And then he did uh, Jodo and EI and never did, I mean, he's ranked now, but at the time he never took any rank. And he didn't state publicly to the dojo, but he said to myself, he says, oh, I don't have any rank. And I said, oh, why is that Sensei? 
And he said, well, I'm the top of my game in Aikido. He said, it's good balance for my personality to be the bottom of the game in something else. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, well, he's just, I, I haven't got enough good things to say about that man. He's just like a really honest, hardworking guy who just likes to bang, you know. That, like, that, that's pretty cool. You know, one thing I've noticed, and, and that is, it, it is easy for somebody coming brand new into martial arts to see a kind of a roadmap laid out for them initially. Mm. And, mm. and I would say that's probably the best defense that I can have for Q ranks. And maybe this is where we talk a little bit about the, the ranks up, up to black belt. And I, and I, I definitely see some purpose and it, it allows you to kind of, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, spoon feed some focus to students that are learning to progress along in martial arts. Uh, it's good to give them some direction. Um, I think that goes along with the balance of making sure that they know the, the color of your belt or the rank that you have really doesn't mean a lot. Really what you're doing right now is you are focusing on personal development. And in the queue, in the first few years, uh, for me, it's generally about four or five years that I have students in the Q ranks, you know, I'll tell them like, this doesn't get you any privilege. In fact, a belt really is just more responsibility that you have for students younger than you, and you are responsible for their advancement. If they're getting frustrated and not learning, you should be right there to help them get past that frustration. But in doing so, as you progress, the next thing that you're going to be testing for has got greater pressure has got greater challenges and it kind of lays them all out. I think that, that once you get to black belt though, you should have started to evolve to become in many ways, your own coach. You should have learned things like self-analysis, breaking down what you need to work on so that you don't rely on having somebody to have to crack the whip on you. There's a time to start transitioning into taking responsibility for your own martial development. And that's a big part of, of that showdown threshold. And you, you start, I think, start per, starting to learn, through, learn that through the Q ranks is important. Um, it's a funny story. I was actually talking to a student of mine who studied here in town at a, at a dojo that did, they didn't do belt colors, uh, but they did do the ranks. And when he went to sign up, they said, well, you know, because the topic got brought up of ranks and they said, well, you know, rank doesn't mean anything to us here. You know, we don't have belt colors or anything like that. And he's like, OK, so his first class, he goes to line up and he just lines up kind of right in the middle. And they, he, they said they just yelled at me like, no, you, you're not ranked high enough. You got to go down on the end. He's like, I didn't even know. So I'm like, this is the hypocrisy that that seems to come out. One of the many that happen in the martial arts world where you just you minutes ago you told them that rank didn't mean anything and then he gets yelled at for being in the wrong place because and of course he a brand new person you don't know what rank is who because you don't mm. know the belt colors or anything like that like that's almost a gotcha trap for new people like uh -huh. to tell them that there's some sort of a code they have to abide by but they don't know what it is you know no, we're not going to tell you what it is we're not going to tell you to it out. we're not going to lay it out and but it, when you step over it we're going to smack yeah, you, we'll you know, smack you back smack yeah. you, the news uh -huh. the, you know on the, on the nose with a rolled up newspaper and i, I kind of laughed and i said yeah you know um it, it's sad but that kind of stuff does happen and i don't think enough people really sort of think about how hypocritical little stuff like that in the grand scheme of martial arts training that's a kind of a little thing but mm. it, it's, in my opinion, it's one of those things that tears down trust. The last thing is mm. a that you tell somebody as a teacher is here's how things are and then have them walk over and in 10 seconds, they realize it's not the way that you just told them. Uh, uh, uh. You know what I mean? And they're wondering, yeah. why did they just, why did that teacher just lie to me? You know, and then, what are they going to lie to me about next? What do I have to figure uh, out between what they've said and what they're actually doing? That's a good and, point. Because a lot of martial artists give a lot of lip service while wow, the belt just holds up the pants and it really doesn't mean anything. And then they strut around like like uh, roosters with their big rank and their belt with stripes all over it and all different colors. And, you know, it's like, wait a second. <laughs> uh, my friend out there, it's the one that uh, that I, I really like is when I see like introductions on like Facebook groups and people are, my name is so-and-so Dai Sensei. 
or then like right. you know so and so Shihan, and I'm always like, yeah. Though the titles are a whole nother kettle of fish, we could jump I'm right like, into. Wow, <laughs> really? That's so cool. You know, like, who am I? I'm Reg. Sorry, I haven't got any like really cool title to throw in there. You know, like it's, yep. you know, Reg is what you get, and that's mm-hmm. pretty much about it. And, sure. You know. Not that I'm not without my ego. I got, oh, yeah, we I'm all have ours. I'm an egomaniac, narcissistic. <laughs> oh, we have a little another connection. I don't rely on a title to feed into that ego that I have, and I don't even rely on my belt to feed into that ego I have. I just naturally mm-hmm. born with a lot of ego, and, you know. Oh, we're all human, and we, <laughs> we have our, our, uh, our egos yeah, and our pride and our vanity. Um, you know, it's, Oh, there you are. There we go. Okay. I see. There yeah, as human beings, I think we all have our, our pride. We all have our egos. We all have our vanity. We have the desire to be accepted and respected. Um, I think that that ranks tend to seem like it's the, the, uh, the fast lane to getting respect and, you know, it, people being what they are, it works, you know, when you've mm. got a big shot title and a, in a, you know, high rank and, it tends to get a lot of bows and a lot of, you know, oses and, and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all prove ourselves by how we behave and how we act. Um, you know, I, I've, I've long wondered as I was looking at this whole Udansha thing about the old school uh, method of giving a teaching certificate. And rather than a bunch of ranks, you either can have, know enough to teach or you don't. And maybe that would be mm. cleaner uh, approach to have, cause I do like the showdown threshold. I think that a, a coming of age, uh, type ceremony or a, uh, performance thing is a good idea. And I think, I think the rank of showdown is, is a very fitting and it's, it's one of the, it's a very special thing for anybody that goes through it. Um, but I think maybe beyond that would be, you know, you spend years in training and, and you're granted basically a, a certificate that you can teach the art. Um, I'm not sure how much exchanging one system of formalities for another one would be fitting. Like w- what would replace a Don system? I don't even know if it would need replacement. I, I even question whether it needs to be there at all. I mean, what, what benefit does it provide? Um, again, I suppose if you're in a big organization. I agree. I think we could, yeah, we could dump the whole thing, and I'd be I'd be very fine with that personally. Sure. Yeah. I just think that's then if if the whole world did it, then eventually somebody would figure out how to like turn it into a business venture that you you, oh, know, yeah. you, you don't have. I don't know. I, I'm people would figure out. I I think oh, yeah. not people. I'm I'm that's that's not quite fair. I don't think everybody. I think those politicians that run organizations would mm-hmm. definitely figure out some way to like grist you for something, you know, mm-hmm. like, I, I just really think they, they'd figure out, they'd figure out some way, you know? Well, yeah. And with especially when, I don't, when, I don't know what they do. When the benefit is you make more money and the second benefit is you have uh, a mechanism of controlling other people, uh, subordinates in your organization. Mm-hmm. And that's that at the bottom, the bottom line is going to be, if you're running an organization, you got to control these people somehow. And if you control them for who gets the cookies, well, there you go. You know, you have it. And, you know, I, I got to see uh, in an organization that I'm not, was not in, but I was, I got to go see this test. I saw a fourth Don test and it was unusual that they actually had this be a test. And now that I remember what it looked like, they probably shouldn't have, they probably should have just awarded it to him because it was, it was kind of a car wreck. Um, but this organization was, was under the Ike Kai, but it was its own organization, fairly large. And, uh, he, and because they were part of Ike Kai, they, they had the Ike Kai requirements for a certain number of hours training in order to test and certain number of amount of time at rank before he tested. He did not meet either of those requirements, but he was tested anyway because he gave a pair of NFL tickets to the Sheehan. Like it was a total like, you know, mafia under the table payoff kind of a deal. 
and the test oh my it was it was bad it was it was one of those you just kind of it was a cringeworthy kind of a thing and um uh, you know it's but you know and of course i look over to the other people that i knew you know in the organization they're just kind of they look at me and shake their head <laughs> you know it's like what do you do you know it's it, it as you said before it is basically one man giving another person their endorsement and that's all it is and what happens if that one person <laughs> handing it out, the, if their integrity is a little sketchy, well, it, it'll mean really nothing more than that. Um, so, and, and I do see the same thing. In fact, it's always funny for me to go look at um, bios on martial artists or especially instructors websites where they're like three pages long of, you know, third down in this, fifth down in this you know, instructor that fourth down in this, you know, and they're just listing off every little cookie that they've ever gotten in, a, in, in that way, of, I guess, with the intent of just impressing people. And, mm. you know, those, I've seen people like that, that do know their stuff. And I've seen a bunch of people like that, that don't know their stuff. And there's that list will not tell you whether they, they are capable and competent or not. So, no. um, well, it's getting less, more and more difficult. I think as i mentioned before might have been one of the times we had that we had to restart over because of this connection issue but yeah yeah uh brazilian jiu-jitsu you know bjj they used to be what like eight to ten years to get a black belt in it it was like one of the hardest martial arts to get a black belt in mm -hmm. and then it became really 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 popular and then next thing you know there's academies because i was watching a joe rogan podcast about this not, not even so long ago Mm -hmm. that a pretty famous instructor where they were talking about yeah now you know like this guy opens his academy and you know he's a legit teacher but then just basically like three to four years you can buy your black belt and you know whatever right more or less and then just get mm -hmm. given out he says why is somebody going to come to my academy when it's going to take eight to ten years when you can go like down the street and get it from this guy and it's the unfortunate thing that i no. I think when the belt or when the paper becomes more important than the skill, right, or becomes more important than the, uh, it sounds so melodramatic, but it becomes more important than the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into like getting the mm -hmm. the number or getting the the belt or whatever right. else. That's the part that for myself that I just can't personally can't like come to terms where i can't understand it mm -hmm. like why like uh, honorary belts and i get different people have different ideas for why they give out an honorary belt and or an honorary rank or whatever and i don't know i don't know all the situation i don't know all the all the factors so mm -hmm. i'm not going to bother to really judge it but why would you even want it like i i don't know i personally wouldn't want it you know what i mean like if I didn't earn it, I, you know, it, it's, it's so stupid. And sometimes I shoot myself in the foot. So like I tell my, my students here, like teaching Aikido, I tell them, if you're not going to teach Aikido, you really don't need to go past Shodan. Eh? You just, right. it's not like I'm going to teach you anything different than I teach like, mm -hmm. you know, second down, third down, fourth down or something like I'm, it's going to be the same class mm -hmm. and I'm going to focus on you in the class and like what you tell you what you need to work on push you where you need to be pushed the same as i am anyone else it doesn't matter mm -hmm. so if you have no intention to ever teach it save your money you know just be happy with show like you know like don't don't waste your time right. you're, you're gonna get the same training it's not gonna change <laughs> well and, and as you go along in my mind what should what should be going on in your head is your own focus on better performance better efficiency, you know, tightening up your movement, all the, the tangible things, but you don't need a rank to do that. You, you nope. certainly, you know, you don't need to, to strut around, you know, the dojo and be Mr. Big, big shot to, to work on those things. And, and I, and I agree with you, if you're, you're not teaching, um, you know, what does it really matter? You know, of course, being a teacher myself and having my own dojo, one of the things that everybody asks when they come in is, well, how long does it take to get a black belt? And do you guys have ranks? And, you know, that tends to be just the lay person's kind of mindset, which is why, why transitioning them from, okay, I, I, I get how you understand that martial arts works with the belt thing. That's cool. 
let me show you how to a better way to look at it and we'll do it as we train along so you can kind of learn to transition away from the i guess you might call it materialistic view of why i need to be a certain rank or i want to have you know want to have a certain certificate or level of achievement or what have you um but i think by the time that showdown rolls around you know at least i like to make sure that students have a grasp on this belt is not going to save you from an ass whipping it's not going to you know going to stop a bullet or do anything on its own you are going to do that and if you if your focus is on your own skill and on your own quality of performance the rank means nothing after that you know it'll it'll yeah. come i mean you get to, if you get to that but if you stay on that focus you will get that showdown and mm. you know i i don't grant any rank beyond showdown for the exact reason that that you uh talked about um but also i had to tell them, my students when i was contemplating when i how to handle this is say well the other practical thing is if you are a nidan sandan you know whatever you go to another dojo or another organization they're not going to honor it they'll they the good chance they'll honor your showdown but anything beyond that they will usually say well you're going to have to test for our nidan or sandan or what have you but so i'm like so what practical use is having a, a beyond showdown rank and fortunately the very first uh student that i had that i had to go over this with had the perfect attitude like i don't care at all about rank i just want to build my own personal skill like that is the nice. perfect attitude um yeah. but we never had an issue with it uh so uh, it's it's just so easy in my opinion it's destructive the, the advanced don rank thing is because it distracts you it actually takes you off the track of focusing on your own development um especially when they remove the actual hard test the performance evaluation yeah aspect of it yeah you know and in fact i wanted to do the reverse and have all right let's do periodic performance evaluations there's no rank attached to them we're just going to say all right now it's going to be like a go time kind of thing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so to me that would be a more practical thing that it would not attach the the pride and the ego but it would certainly focus you on your own performance and your own training and development especially yeah. spotting the, the deficiencies because that's that's what where I, what i really liked about competing is it was a no bs feedback about what can what is your training good is it got some gaps and if so where are the gaps and that gives you a list of what you take back into the dojo and you train up so that the next time you go compete you won't have that problem again so yeah and i liked how you you post my, my or so about your spear sparring and i'm like i love i love the spear work stuff especially when you go live because it teaches you so much that 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 katas and forms don't like it it's that chance to put it all together not to jump tracks on the topic <laughs> so no, I, 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 it's yeah. no problem i uh yeah that's that is a cool part about Hozoin, and there's a couple other spear schools here in Japan, like Owari Kandyu and stuff that mm -hmm. also do it is that they they have the, the concept that when you've learned all of the kata, mm -hmm. that you then need to pressure test it. Right. That you then need to know that the person that's coming in is not going to attack where you where the kata tells you they're going to attack, mm -hmm. you're going to deal with it. And the, the densho, so the, the writings from the school that had existed for over 400 years, from the very beginning i've had that as part of the school right that they like drew like diagrams of how to make protective equipment and protective spheres and then mm -hmm. state you must test this stuff consistently you know sure. you've got to polish so do they it, have uh, rank in that organization you know. yes they do um no belts nothing on the outside that mm -hmm. would like the, the, I think the difference is, so they have, they call Shoku, Chuku, Joku. Um, so like beginner Q, middle Q, and upper Q. And then after that, it's uh, Mokoroku, then Menkyo, then Menkyo Kaide. So Menkyo Kaide means you've learned everything. And okay. Mokoroku just means you're like catalog. Mm. So they actually don't count it in that school that you're part of, that you're actually part of the school until you're Mokoroku. Mm then you're actually considered a member of the Ryu, the school. Mm. 
So before that, you wear this uh, nafuda, so like a name tag on your dogi, so that the teachers can learn your name. And then once you pass Mokuroku, you take the name tag off because now they actually know your name. And incidentally, that's when you can start doing the free sparring and stuff because you've learned at that point, you've learned all of the all of the school. You've learned all, all the the physical kata. Mm. So then it's just a matter of working on it, refining it, theoretically everything getting together. Better at it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so I like I like I like that, you know. Um yeah, I I don't know. I I hate the system. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, I, I think there's so much negative that it brings balance trying and trying to balance it with what is the benefit that it brings i I, to me those those scales are really tipped the wrong way um there's there's too much distraction and politics and i guess for lack of a better word corruption that comes along with it for what tangible benefit i'm i don't maybe a little bit but certainly not enough to warrant kind of what uh what goes with it I'll tell you, my friend, the, the, the funny thing is here in Japan, they are so rank conscious, right? Mm. They really rank conscious. And so they will like find out, oh, you do martial arts. Yes. Oh, what do you study? So then you tell them, generally, they don't even know what it is. If it's not like judo, kendo, or karate, they pretty much don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. And that's the Japanese, right? Mm-hmm. And so then you're like, oh, I do this. And then the very next thing in the world, what rank are you? Mm-hmm. so then i like usually like blink at them for a while like okay why does that matter but then i'll say okay i'm like this rank oh you must be good and i and i will honestly look at them and say what made you think that <laughs> oh because you have this rank yeah that doesn't mean anything it's a receipt it means i paid for it All right and mm-hmm. now mind you that's just my cheeky answer to people on the street because as i told you it's it's, I believe it's a representation of a relationship with my teachers. Right. And so but what I that means. What you're me that. saying, I mean, it's similar to here in the States where people attach a certain value because they, they don't know any better. And, and they think, oh, black belt is that, that you must be good. You know, oh, yeah. you've got a black belt. You know, I hear yeah. that all the time. And, um, uh, you know, you can say, well, yeah, it could, you know, but how do you explain standard? You know, when you go to. Yeah some sleazy dive and you ask for hamburger it's a lot different than a you know premier steak joint serving a hamburger like there's yeah. this is almost unrecognizable one to the other uh, right even though they have the same name so yeah uh, and i don't like i said i don't think it's i don't think it, there is a solution to standardize the quality of a shodan or a needon or sound or anything like that even within well, you're right, our own organization it, it, it really does go by, I mean, I teach myself. I can't look at all of my students and say, every single one of you will have the exact same standard to reach Shodan. Like all of you have to meet. Mm-hmm. I've got one lady who's 57 years old. And mm-hmm. I think she maybe tops out at like four foot seven, right. you know? And then I've got some other guy that's like 22 years old and probably tops at around six foot and he's pretty fit and so mm-hmm. it's like do i would i expect that both of these people would have exactly the same stand and this is where i think it becomes a personal thing between you and the teacher mm-hmm. because i could justify giving that lady her showdown and giving that guy his showdown started to where you are now you have reached what i think for you is your showdown mm-hmm. you know what i mean Sure. And for that guy, that's his shodan. To say it's, uh, it sounds contrived, but I think if you say it's, you know, the shodan, no, I think there's like your shodan and your shodan, and it might not necessarily be the same shodan, but you both equally earned it. Right. I, I, I agree with you. And I think having thought through that very scenario, because I've been faced with it, it's one thing, because I do, I do believe that the, the shodan, that I would grant would be, it was, it would be a very personal between me and the, the student and it has been, uh, but there is a balance between the, the skills and the development and then the character. If I really think that somebody would not have, not be able to with good judgment and character wield 
the martial ability that I'm teaching them, they wouldn't make it to Shodan anyway. I would, mm. they, they wouldn't be my student. If I have that mm. kind of concern about character, they would not make it that way. However, I've run into people with Sterling character that have no physical ability. And to me, that would be my job of, I don't need to work on your character as much as I need to give you the physical ability so that, you know, you'll have a chance to survive if you need, if you need it, if you're faced with violence. Um, but I've never tried to say, well, uh, you know, what percentage would I put on my showdowns of surviving violence? They have to be like 80%, 80 percent chance of surviving a real world attack. Like how would you, you couldn't even put a number like that out? No. You know, but to say, it's all not right, quantifiable. I'm, yeah, it's totally unquantifiable, totally subjective. Um, but to say, I've given you the, the solid skills and we've proven through our training that you can do this, you can handle, you know, people deftly or, or at least well, you've got a good chance, you know, you're, you're well-rounded, you can, you know, handle a bunch of different types of challenges because we do that, you know, I, it is subjective and I'd be the first one to admit that, but, um, you know, and I, I do hate the, the constant attitude of, well, you know, and I've seen instructors do this all over the place. Well, my brown belt is the equivalent of anybody else's showdown. You know, they'll, they'll always say we're, we're tougher here in our school than everybody else is. And that's kind of a, it's almost like a, you know, on the brochure selling point. Uh, but, you know, I can't count the number of times I've heard that exact same thing. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny, it's kind of funny to hear it, you know, and then you say, well, Typically, how long do students take to get their showdowns? Oh, like three years or two years or something like that. And I've heard rumor that that in Japan, especially in Aikido, that that black belts are pretty uh, quick to get, uh, even higher higher rank. Very easy. I don't know if that's rumor or not, but um, that's kind of the word. And I I don't know if I the, think that really depends. I think it depends on the school. Sure. And, and I mean, I don't know if that's maybe Aikido is struggling to remain relevant and to attract people because people will be attracted like you said earlier they'll be attracted to i can get a black belt in a year or two years as opposed to five or eight years um you know i don't know I've i think in japan though the, and it's been said before but i actually really do think it's true you know living here i think they view like i think if in canada if you say oh i'm i'm a, I'm a showdown well you wouldn't even probably say that because it'd be like quasi like japanese mm -hmm. now you're like uh what do they call that cultural misappropriation or anyway whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, i'm a black belt and so you know and then it's like wow you're like a master you're like a black belt you're a showdown mm -hmm. you know and sure i mean i took how long did i take to get my showdown and i trained a lot mm -hmm. and i took Almost seven years. Okay. To get my show done. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I took almost seven years. And that wasn't because my teacher had that. Like he usually, the average in his dojo was about five years mm -hmm. to get the show done. I took a little longer because I really suck. And just because I wasn't really in a hurry, you know. Sure. So I was mm -hmm. like, well, there's no rush. I just plug along. Uh, I do think they really, they do view it as that first step. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of easier to get the showdown in Japan because they really don't view it as like a big deal. Yeah. Is that what it it's is? Like, yeah. Like, well, you have a black belt. Yeah. I'm showdown. They're like, oh yeah. Cool. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Yeah. The, uh... I think, I think it's the impression I have anyway. Sure. Sure. Uh... You know, yeah, uh, I, th I think with, and of course, you know, when people think about martial arts, especially without any actual training, they think Kung Fu Panda, you know, what, whatever movie or cultural sources they tend to have. And, and it's, uh, there, there is that bit of bridging the understanding from somebody who's, who is not in the culture of the actual martial arts culture into something that's better. And, it's just disappointing when it's kind of used as bait to keep people in, in it, you know, and I know that the, it's not the only one that's used. Um, you know, I, I know that, for example, some 
karate is actually invented more kata because when they ran out of kata, people would quit training. Like, oh, I've learned them all. I've learned all 30 or whatever it is. And say, well, we need more. So we'll design more. So we'll keep students around longer. Again, not to say that there's anything wrong with, you know, coming up with different interpretations or different exercises or, you know, more content to, to study. But I think breaking students out of that mentality is an important thing for a teacher to do. In fact, it's probably one of the most important things for them because that's, uh, that's their mind. If, you, if their mind is stuck in that merit badge realm, you got to get out of that. It's, it, won't, it won't serve you in the long run. Um, but that's just my, well, I, my opinion on it. Well, I think the whole way society has moved towards like participation medals and like, so there's no first place, second place, third place, like everybody's a winner. So everybody, you know, gets your little gold star on your chart, your little sticker, you know, your little stamp. And everybody seeks it because they're always seeking for like this approval. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to become more difficult to, I don't know, get people out of that thing, that thought process when it's so prevalent in society, I think. Right. I think the only way to really, I think through the, 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 the teacher's own integrity and their own, not necessarily even in what they say, but just in how they act. Absolutely. And by, by that, I mean, you know, I would like my students to know that I never stop training. Mm -hmm. I still, you know, I still train 30 hours a week. You know, mm -hmm. I, when I teach my Kenjutsu class on Saturday, none of my students actually practice more than me during the class. And I do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. I'm going to do sets with you and I'm going to do sets with you. So that means that you guys are going to have to like lose some sets because we only have so much time. Mm -hmm. And the person who's going to do all of the sets is me. Well, right. one, it's a chance for me to train with them so I can feel what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm their partner, right? right? So there's only two of them. So I, I train with one guy, the other guy's off to the side doing Suburi by himself. And I go through a couple of sets with this guy and then, okay, switch. And then I go through a couple of sets with this guy and this guy goes and does Subiri on the side. Mm -hmm. I do it. One is because it gives me a chance to feel. I get to receive their technique and feel what they're, they're doing and know what they need to work on. And I can give them some advice after. Mm -hmm. And then also it's because, well, I want to train. <laughs> and so, yeah. So who's the one that gets it? But I think it's, I think it's good. I think I'm lucky in just like those two guys, for example, that I can tell they're really itchy. They, they like what, well, and they want to like jump in and they want to like do more. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, not as like a cookie, but I like to cultivate that feeling. And I, mm -hmm. I like to think that it's my own. I don't, I don't want to use the word integrity, not especially in like using it in conjunction with myself because that just seems dirty. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, my own personality that I don't need to like tell them. I just, they got to say, oh, you know, Reg is always working on, Reg is always training. Reg will come over and like, even in Aikido, like let us throw him and like pin him. And, you know, he's always trying to better himself, oh, lack of a better word, better himself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, without even having to say anything, I would hope that that would translate over to them and Right. I've been pretty lucky so far, even in my Aikido dojo here that I teach. I don't ever have people come in and say, when can I get like the next, you know, like rank? Because I've never, ever, ever heard them ever, never, sure. never said. Yeah. Uh, so I'm lucky. They're, yeah, they're that's good that's good students that are eager to, to train, eager to do reps, and they don't really care about advancement no. or their, I shouldn't say advancement because they're, when you're eager to train, you are interested in your advancement, but it's your your own abilities, not just your the prestige of having a rank or, or some of something like that. Yeah. 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 So I'm lucky. I got, I got, I've got good students. So that's yeah. that, like here. So that mm -hmm. makes me, yeah, really lucky. Like no one ever brings it up. And yeah, I've been lucky if they want, well, although, you know, it's, it's having students that are, that do take when I, when I tell them, all right, we're going to, you're going to be, pre we're preparing you now for your test. And they kind of, their eyes get big and that fire gets lit. I like lighting the fire. 
uh, uh, but, uh, uh. but they don't obsess about it. And I, I will, will tell them like, this is a chance for you to feel what it's like to perform when there's pressure, when there's stress, you know, and having your fellow students sit around, watch you and your instructor sit and watch you when you, when it, they call on you to perform, that is, you, I, I'll usually tell them like, you, this is where you learn how your body and your mind and your Aikido change from when you're relaxed and you're just doing this in class versus when it matters. And this is mm. going to be, you know, just a little sample of the stress that you're probably going to be under if you ever had to use this. Um, mm. Cause that fear is going to bring that heightened anxiety. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, I, I will always tell my students like, this isn't for you getting your rank as much as it is for you learning how you, how you work, uh, learning right, how you right. all that stuff goes. So. Um, that was uh, one of the things that my teacher, you know, Kimeda Sensei in Canada said about Aikido that I, he said, you know, we don't have Shi'ai, so we don't have competition in Aikido. Mm -hmm. So testing and demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Those are the times that you use that, what you would do to prepare for a Shi'ai mm -hmm. and the stress that you would, and that you would feel in a Shi'ai, you know, testing and Embu. That's the same mm -hmm. thing that we use. Sure. Yeah. No, yeah, and, I, and I think that, that pressure is important. The CI, but yeah, there's a certain level of stress calculation that you have to go through so that you don't crumble under fear or intimidation or, or under that real life stress. Um, but absolutely you know, how, how it relates to rank, not that doesn't really, <laughs> especially the Udancha rank stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, suppose we could go on no. it looks like we're having some more connection issues here but yeah a little um, bit was there anything you wanted to add on i figured we'd wrap up and i'll give you the last word on it oh okay uh, you know, it's 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 always refreshing just care about improving the quality of and, you know, hopefully it's kind of like one of those things that in a subconscious way, it's like maybe, although I don't really cross my fingers for it, but maybe like the integrity of the art will, will, will rise up over time. Mm -hmm. One can hope, but uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I can't, I, I, I can't be responsible for my organization and I can't be responsible for like all the other dojos. I can only be responsible for mine. And therefore I'm responsible for my students. They're my responsibility. So yep. that's a great yeah. way to look at it. Stay within yeah. your range of effectiveness. It's what you, that's can... it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. My sphere of influence stops there. <laughs> right. Exactly. So well, that's, that's what so... we, what we all can do. So. Cool. Well, yes. thank you for very much for joining me. Uh, I apologize to everybody for the connection issues that we've been having. Uh, hopefully this will, will come out pretty well, but uh, as always, my friend, I've enjoyed the conversation. Me too, my friend. Thanks a lot. Take care. You thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.